Well, after weeks of infighting, Republicans have agreed to vote today on a budget plan they say will cut the deficit $917 billion over 10 years. The move sets the stage for a shutdown against unified Democratic opposition in the Senate. Independent Senators Joe Lieberman and Bernie Sanders are promising to block it. White House spokesman James Carney warned yesterday that time is running out to reach a compromise. Carney also said Treasury Department officials may soon have to decide who will get government checks and who won't if the Treasury loses borrowing authority. Among the many obligations we have, the 80 million checks that the Treasury Department alone issues, payments that it issues every month, of the 1.2 billion payments the federal government makes in a year, those include veterans payments, Social Security payments disability payments. They include uh, the bills to contractors, small businesses, big businesses that do uh, work with the government, the, Korea, the people who manufacture the ammunition that we send to our troops in Afghanistan. And choices then have to be made. And it's a Sophie's choice, right? Who do you save? Who do you pay? That's an impossible situation that this country has never faced and should never face if Congress does what it was elected to do, and does its job. White House spokesperson Jay Carney. To discuss the debt talks, we're joined by Richard Wolf, professor emeritus of economics at University of Massachusetts Amherst, visiting professor here in New York at New School University, also hosts a weekly program on WBAI called Economic Update. Uh, welcome to Democracy Now! So we are watching this dance in Washington. Uh, the House is going to vote today around the issue of the debt ceiling. The Senate says it's dead in the water. President Obama is vowing to veto. What does this all mean? Well, basically, your word dance is perfect. This is theater. This is political theater in which the two parties are posturing for the election coming next year, using this occasion. To put it in perspective, the number of times the government has raised the debt ceiling since 1940, 90, almost twice a year. This is a normal, automatic procedure. Every president, Republican and Democrat, has asked for it. When they ask, typically, the representatives of the other party say, well, you're not managing the government real well, and then they vote for it. And that has happened over and over again. So what you're seeing is a decision, politically, to make a theatric out of what otherwise would have been a normal procedure. A hundred years ago, the Congress said, in order to control the government and not to allow businesses and rich people to be able to invest in government money easily, we're going to have the government limit how much can be borrowed. That was the idea. Now it became automatic as we became a debt society, <clears throat> Excuse me. and so suddenly the Republicans basically decided to make theater to run their campaign a little early this year and to slow it all down and make a big to-do. The world expects that this will have to be undone in a few days or weeks. They're kind of amazed to see it being stretched like this, this old normal procedure. And the assumption is that the politics in the United States has become as dysfunctional as our economic situation. And so that's the danger that this rigmarole, this theater, is really a sign that normal life in the United States has been disrupted on a scale that people haven't seen before. But when you say that the Republicans decided to make theater out of it, it seems to me that the Democrats also have participated in the process by making this seem like uh, it's Armageddon will occur uh, unless we get this done by August 2nd. And in essence, it's uh, at times it seems almost like the Obama administration is seeking this deadline to start moving in a more centrist direction economically that it has wanted to do, but has been absent a, the type of crisis that it, it would be able to convince the American public that it needs to do. There are certainly signs of that, uh, and they're very troubling to many of us who are economists, right, left, and center, because basically the Democrats have said, we will do massive cuts. They just won't be as massive as the Republicans want. And then they <clears throat> will ap appeal to the American people in the hope that Americans will choose the lesser evil, the Democrats who won't cut so terribly compared to the Republicans. And the Republicans are appealing to folks that are very upset by the economic situation, don't know who to be angry at. In the American way, they get angry at the government. It's a little bit amazing if you take a step back. 
The overwhelming majority of people who have lost their jobs in this crisis have been fired by private employers. The overwhelming majority of people who have been thrown out of their homes have been done, have had that happen because a private bank has gone to court to get that happen, to, to happen. And, and yet the American people have this tendency built into our culture to leap right over the person who's actually done you the damage and to blame the, the government. And so the government in general, and the particular government of Mr. Obama, is the target, and the Republicans are playing on this, and that's their ploy. And the Democrats are saying, well, we're not so bad. We're going to tax the rich just a little and the corporations a little less, and that's something the Republicans won't do, and we will protect your Social Security at least more than. But you're right. In the process, everything moves over to massive cutting. And to, besides the morals of that, it's economically crazy. In an economic situation where a recovery is very poor, very uneven, to have the government cut back the way that spokesman for the White House just told us, is to make an economic situation that's bad worse. So you see a kind of political game being played at the cost of worsening the underlying economic situation. And for, for the world, that suggests a society that's not working. Let's go to President Obama on Monday night when he addressed the nation, reiterating his call for what he described as a balanced approach to deficit reduction involving spending cuts and tax increases on the wealthy. The first approach says, let's live within our means by making serious, historic cuts in government spending. Let's cut domestic spending to the lowest level it's been since Dwight Eisenhower was president. Let's cut defense spending at the Pentagon by hundreds of billions of dollars. Let's cut out waste and fraud in health care programs like Medicare. And at the same time, let's make modest adjustments so that Medicare is still there for future generations. Finally, let's ask the wealthiest Americans and biggest corporations to give up some of their breaks in the tax code and special deductions. This balanced approach asks everyone to give a little without requiring anyone to sacrifice too much. It would reduce the deficit by around $4 trillion and put us on a path to pay down our debt. And the cuts wouldn't happen so abruptly that they'd be a drag on our economy or prevent us from helping small businesses and middle class families get back on their feet right now. Shortly after the president addressed the nation on the budget crisis Monday night, House Speaker John Boehner responded in a televised address. The president is adamant that we cannot make fundamental changes to our entitlement programs. As a father of two daughters, I know these programs won't be there for them and their kids unless significant action is taken now. And the sad truth is that the president wanted a blank check six months ago, and he wants a blank check today. This is just not going to happen. Richard Wolff, um, economist, author, Capitalism Hits the Fan, The Global Economic Meltdown and What to Do About It. I did actually hear the reference to war by President Obama, but it's rarely rarely raised by Democrats or Republicans. Um, one of your colleagues, Joe Stiglitz, um, said over time the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan will cost $5 trillion. There are a number of things that are not on the table. And frankly, uh, I'm amazed that the president refers to what he does as a balanced approach. First of all, the war and its enormous costs off the table in any serious way. Going back to a serious taxation of corporations and of the rich in America, just, for example, at the scale that they were taxed in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, off the table. Basically, what's being done is to suggest that now, after a recovery, in quotations, that has only recovered the stock market and corporate profits and bank reserves, that has done nothing about unemployment and foreclosure. We haven't had a balanced economic arrangement in this country for years. So suddenly we're going to be balanced in what's coming next. That's a strange kind of logic. 
why is there not facing up to the war, the fact that you're not taxing the rich, and perhaps the worst? We're at a crisis because we have an economic system that hasn't worked well, and the government bailed out banks and corporations by using public money. That was done to help them. It hasn't helped many other folks. So now is not the time to do balance. Now is the time to correct the imbalance that has built up over all these years. And I think that would be where the president really ought to start. But you do argue, uh, contrary to some other liberal <clears throat> economists like Paul Krugman, that the deficits are a major problem and that, uh, that the increasing deficit spending of the U.S. government has to be brought into control. So that would seem to indicate that, it, uh, that your main push would be to uh, obviously cut war spending, but also to raise taxes uh, significantly. The most amazing thing to me is that we talk about fixing a government budget that's in trouble, and we don't talk about the revenue side in a serious way. That is an amazing thing. If you look at what happened to the American budget over the last 20 or 30 years, the culprit is obvious. We have dropped corporate taxes. We have dropped taxes on the rich. Let me give you a couple of examples to drive it home. If you go back to the 1940s, here's what you discover that the federal government got 50 percent more money year after year from corporations than it did from individuals. For every dollar that individuals paid in income tax, corporations paid a dollar fifty. If you compare that to today, here are the numbers. For every dollar that individuals pay to the federal government, corporations pay 25 cents. That is a dramatic change that has no parallel in the rest of our tax code. Another example, in the 50s and 60s, the top bracket the income tax rate that the richest people had to pay. For example, the 50s and 60s, it was 91 percent. Every dollar over 100,000 that a rich person earned, he or she had to give 91 cents to Washington and kept nine. And the rationale for that was we had come out of a Great Depression, we had come out of a Great War, we had to rebuild our society, we were in a crisis, and the rich had the capacity to pay, and they ought to pay. Republicans voted for that, Democrats voted for that. What do we have today? 91 percent? No. The top rate for rich people today, 35 percent. Again, nobody else in this society, not the middle, not the poor, have had anything like this consequence. So over the last 30, 40 years, a shift from corporate income tax to individual income tax and among individuals from the rich to everybody else. To deal with our budget problem without discussing that, putting that front and center, making that part of the story, that's just a service to the rich and the corporations. There's no polite way to say otherwise. And there's something shameful about keeping all of that away and focusing on how we're going to take out our budget problems by cutting back benefits to old people, to people who have medical needs. There's something bizarre, and the world sees that, in a society that has done what it has done and now proposes to fix it on the backs of the majority. And the argument that you give the money to the corporations and to the banks, and they will help people. They're the generator of jobs. The Republicans say it, and President Obama has said it repeatedly. He is going to provide incentives, he said, for years now. He is going to provide inducements and support for the private sector to put people back to work. We have a 9.2 percent unemployment rate. That's what it's been for the last two years. That policy has not worked. If corporations were going to do what the president gave them incentives to do, they would have done it. They're not doing it. There's no sign they're going to do it. You have to face that policy didn't work. What's the alternative? Well, we don't have to look far. Roosevelt in the 1930s, the last time we faced this kind of situation, went on the radio in 1933 and 1934, and he gave speeches. And in those speeches, he said the following. If the private sector either cannot or will not provide work for millions of our citizens ready, able, and willing to work, then the government has to do it. And between 1934 and 1941, the federal government created and filled 11 million jobs. The most amazing thing in the United States is not that we're not doing it. The most amazing thing is 
There's no bill to do it. There's no discussion to do it. The president of the country never refers to it, keeps telling us, and the Republicans do the same, that the private sector is where we should focus our expectations. The private sector has answered. We are not going to hire people here. We're either going to hire no one, because we don't like the way the economy looks, or we're going to hire people in other countries, because they pay lower wages there. That's a response of the private sector taking care of itself. It's not a responsible way to run a society.